folks, and welcome, welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and this podcast is brought to you, among others, by Native Shark, which is an online platform for learning Japanese. And what Native Shark do is they make learning Japanese really, really simple. You log in, you click a button that says study now, and the platform then shows you exactly what you need to learn next based on your previous progress. Now, again, this is simple, but the way it's designed means that students who use Native Shark once a day for four to five months can complete the equivalent of over two years of university study. And this is not just、um, them patting themselves on the back. Now that Native Shark's been in business for over a year, the results are in. So, this is exactly what people are saying.、Uh, just looking at a couple of posts in their community forums. And the student community, by the way, is one of the best things about the platform. So, one person's writing, most productive year I've had learning Japanese. And then another one says, I've started learning over a year ago with all of these other platforms, and what I learned there is only a fraction of what I've learned on Native Shark in just three months. And then yet another one goes, In my mind, my study timeline only started with Native Shark because that's when I really started learning consistently, and on and on. So, yet the proof's in the pudding. It's definitely the best online course out there. And since you've heard about it here on the podcast, you also get an extra little bonus. If you sign up for their free trial、uh, using the URL nativeshark.com forward slash NTI, and we'll link to it in this episode's show notes. So that's native without an E. So N A T I V shark, all one word, dot com forward slash NTI. You use that link to sign up and you'll get a double length free trial. So two weeks free instead of just the one. No need to put in your credit card or anything of that sort. You can just sign up, give it a shot. And chances are, at the end of these two weeks, you'll already be far ahead of wherever you are with your Japanese at the moment, whether you're just starting out or you're already in knee deep. Give it a shot. NativeShark.com forward slash NTI. Okay, so for today's episode, this is another group session with our Japan Real Estate Experts panel. And on this occasion, we dig deep into renovations, repairs, and rebuilds. So, how much does it cost? When is it not worth to renovate and more efficient to just demolish and reconstruct a brand new home? The types of renovations you'd need to do on a short term stay property, so Airbnb style property, to comply with health and safety regulations, and much, much more. We also touch a little bit on the topic of capital depreciation and why it's still worth buying homes or investment properties in a country where banking on capital growth is not really a reliable strategy. So, spoiler, it's totally worth it due to the amount of rent you would have saved、uh, or the amount of rental income you would have accrued by the time you'll sell, but you'll get into the detail, detailed conversation. And Matt gets attacked by killer bees towards the end there, so you definitely want to watch this on YouTube and stick with us to the very, very end、uh, for a very humorous uh, uh, killer bee attack for everyone except Matt, maybe. And just before we get right into it, you might recall that I've mentioned my pet project on our last episode, so the business networking and gaming weekend that I'm putting together here in Fukuoka City. So, good news to anyone who's from the area or just wants to make other arrangements rather than stay at the hotel where we're holding the event. Or even if you just want to come in for a day or two rather than for the whole weekend. So, the Montan Hakata, which is where the event is going to be held, has recently confirmed that people who are not staying overnight will also be able to use the public facilities. So, the two private conference rooms and, of course, the main lounge area where most of the activities will take place. So, this is really shaping out to be quite the event. Looks like we're going to have quite a few people, whether they're staying at the hotel or just coming in for the day or the,、um, or, or the entire weekend. We're going to be running from early Friday afternoon and all the way till midnight on Friday, 7 a.m. till midnight on Saturday, and 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. on Sunday. So, we've now added single day attendance tickets to the booking form, which we'll link to in this episode show notes. So, with or without meals, as you prefer. So, yeah, if you're in Japan this December, we'd love for you to join us. We've got Jason Ball as our designated business speaker, the admin and manager of Japan's biggest English language、uh, business networking group. It's called Business in Japan with over 60,000 members. And he's going to be talking to us about building and maintaining successful business relationships in Japan. And also, what to look out for when you're starting new businesses here. I'm going to do a short presentation on property investment in Japan. 
And we're still hoping to secure a gaming industry speaker as well. So if you're listening and you know anyone who would be interested in giving a short speech, uh, presentation, uh, panel, seminar, whatever they're interested in doing, do let me know. So yeah, 10 to 12 December in Fukuoka. It's a short budget flight away from either Tokyo or Osaka, probably from Sapporo as well, if that's where you are. So looking forward to meeting all of you face to face. All right, so now for our JREP session, as promised, all about rebuilding and or renovating homes in Japan and all that involves. Enjoy, and I'll see you again on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <clears throat> so how was uh, all of our weeks? Very good. <laughs> pretty, pretty. Where are you, Matt? Are you... Uh, this, I'm in Yugawara. This is, this is my balcony. So, wow. yeah, this, like, like the sun, the sun rises right <laughs> over there. <laughs> oh, very jealous. Actually. I'm actually in my office, but I've got like all the windows closed, all the shutters closed and just like a forward facing light um, <laughs> to, to make me look a bit clear. No, let me. Knowing now. All right, so anything exciting happened last week? What are we doing today? Are we doing questions or any topics or what do we want to do? Uh, for, for on my end, the uh, we talked about it a bit last week, but um, auctions are coming up a bit as well as flipping. Yeah. Uh, and I think flipping is actually an interesting thing I wouldn't mind talking about, but those are sort of the two topics that are kind of hot on my uh, on my plate this week. Yeah. I actually had somebody call me about um, about auctions today. He found a ski resort property. That's what we discussed last week too. A ski resort property for sale, including the uh, backlog of uh, building fees and taxes. Like the total would be about ten thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "All right, but building fees are four hundred bucks a month, so I can rent it out when I'm not here, right?" And then, nope, you cannot do that. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, he did mention that he saw, Trace, you probably know more about that. He did mention that he saw a lot of people, uh, not in that particular building, but a lot of people in that area. That was, I think, uh, Niigata. Um, people that have units in resorts are definitely advertising them on uh, Airbnb and other platforms. And I thought Airbnb were clamping down on that. You can only rent on Airbnb if you have a license. So, And you can only get a license if you have... Kumiai, uh, Kumiai permission. Yeah. Um, and you also need a, a registered uh, Minpaku Kandi. Um, so um, I had someone, someone reach out to me this week uh, asking me to be a Minpaku Kandi for them in Kobe, but I don't think I could do that. So Yeah, I think, was that the thing on Facebook that I think I saw you responding yeah. to? Okay. Because mm. um, one thing, that if, if it is, I know generally in Tokyo, like in, in residential mansions we say that it's hard to get the building management approval to or, or they actually have to change the bylaws to allow short-term stays yes. if it's in the if it's a resort building though um i i feel that they maybe would like that that may be a different discussion in terms of the um the building management allowing short-term stays if originally it is a resort type building I actually found that they're even stricter than the normal uh, residential blocks. Like there's actually, um, we had one customer who purchased in one of these uh, ski resort type places. And um, he said he attended a few of the Kumiai meetings and there were people like aggressively attacking somebody who was renting out units and like, no, this is only for us and our families and it's not allowed and we'll sue you. And, and Honestly, yeah, my, my take on the whole situation is like, can you do it? Yeah, there's hoops to jump through and everything, but like, do you really want to deal with that? <laughs> it just seems like so much work and not really. Again, like I think the uh, uh, Tracy, your is the juice worth the worth the squeeze sort of thing is to me that just seems like such a such a pain that I wouldn't recommend it. It depends where you are. I mean, so for example, people who are in Chiba uh, for right now, people that have a beach house or whatever, they're having the best years of their life. Mm. um their, their prices are up there they're renting you know uh masses amount if you're in the city it's crickets um unfortunately um but um 
because of the domestic really- tourism, because people are happy to go near the beach, right? Yeah. That's right. And and what you see um, in places um, like Hakuba, like Shimoda, like uh, Chiba, um, places that were, uh, you know, you know, really targeting, you know, inbound tourists, they're now being filled by, t- uh, you know, local people who can't get out of Japan. Yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of expat, I, I know, I, I, I'm thinking <clears throat> just even 10, 10 expat families off the top of my head who have rented a whole house in Hakuba for, this, for, for the summer. Um, and I know another family who rented an Airbnb for a year in Shimoda. Uh, when the when um, when the pandemic broke out, they just picked up the the kids um, and threw them in the car with the dog and just went and moved to Shimoda, uh, and uh, and they can do that. And so um, they just got out of the city. They can't go overseas. They need to spend their money somehow. They're still on full full wages, full salaries. Yeah. Um, they just have to work from home. So my, you might as well make that home uh, somewhere where you've got a nice view. So right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's what I did. <laughs> so people that are people that are running guest houses, um, you know, in in Hakuba, in uh, yeah, in Shimoda, are are having a great year. Chiba. I mean, I myself have booked, um, you know, booked Airbnbs in in Chiba and uh, in uh, you know Nagano and and in Yamanakako. So I've done that myself and like booked a b- big old house and had a couple of families uh, go and stay. So I did that in the summer. Uh, we all we all tested ourselves with a PCR test uh, mm-hmm. before we went, um, and uh, so uh, two families went. And, went and booked in a in a big old house we had a great time the kids you know we just stayed inside and did jigsaw puzzles and and watched the typhoon go through and and it was just brilliant and the kids could just you know run and and uh, be outside and there were deer in the front yard so there there's a there's a there's a lifestyle choice um if you're running a short term in the city right now no it's 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 grim because if, if you own a house, it's a lot easier. Like you don't need to care about what anybody else says, right? I mean, there might be some local regulations from the uh, from the ward office, but that's about it, right? Well, yes, there's local regulations, but you also need to be able to pass the the certificate for safety. So yeah. there's a few there's a few other regulations. So that so um, you know, without getting into the weeds too much, um, uh, you have to have the house retrofitted for um, uh, fire. fire alarms yeah. where if there's a fire in one room it goes off in every other room of the house uh, so that's not normal for a domestic residence it's normally the fire alarm goes off in that one room and that's it but for a short-term rental house you do need to have it so that either with a hard cable or with a um, or on a wi-fi system so that fire alarm goes off in room one um, the whole house goes off uh, you need to have some exit lighting that is hardwired to the mains so it never goes off um, I, I mean and the companies that are retrofitting they're they're charging an absolute fortune because they can um, yeah. but once you've got the certificate uh, so you need the certificate and you need um, you know a few you know, bits and pieces and jump through a few hoops and, and de- declarations of I'm not crazy and I'm not bankrupt. Um, <laughs> I swear, I know I love those declarations. I swear I'm not crazy. Um, That's something that a crazy person would say. Crazy person would say. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and then it's just a matter of, of filling all the forms and, and uh, meeting the regulations. So uh, the squeeze in that case is worth the juice for a house. Oh, for let, a, me, let me... Let me clarify real quick. The uh, we we were briefly talking about like the hotel, the resort thing. That to me is what seems just like I. I mean, if you want to touch it, okay, whatever, we can help. But like, it seems not again worth it. But with kind of the smaller scale stuff, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that down here. In fact, uh, starting next month, we've got another Aki Ryokan that we picked up um, that we're converting into like guest house sort of stuff. Um, so, like, that's totally moving right now. That's and that's a good business opportunity, I think. Well, so, 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 somebody found a ski resort for sale, like a like a boutique hotel that they wanted to buy and renovate. Is that right? Yes, that's me? what it sounded like Zib was saying. Oh, is it, but, yeah. Oh no, no, there was one unit within a resort. It was a single unit within a co-owned strata kind of. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, that also seems very 
annoying. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Matt, with. with the hotel license, you can conceivably at least double your uh, annual income, right? Because you'll be able to rent out throughout the year, not just half of it. Correct, correct. I, I, I think there's a big opportunity in um, revamping motels, revamping love hotels, revamping. Um, I really have... I really, really want to get into this business and I actually have um, a pitch deck all ready to go for a, an investor um, to, to try and do this business. So, and I think the, the revamping old motels, retro motels is a big thing in the US right now. Uh, just, yeah. watch Net, just watch Netflix and you can see all of the, the revamping and, you know, turning, you know, motel sixes into, you know, hipster hangouts and turning, um, uh, you know, into boutique properties uh, using a, a short-term rental uh, mentality, using a short-term rental business model, but running <laughs> running a hotel license through a short-term rental business model. I think that's a really interesting segment to be, and Japan hasn't got there yet, and I really, really want to do it. I just don't have the money right now. I know, so. I know somebody down here. I'm not particularly, like, friends or anything with them, but I do know one person who did buy up a, uh, a love hotel and is converting it into, like, a teleworking station. Oh, nice. I think it's a, I think nice. it's a good idea. I, I nice. don't have... I don't have very much faith in this particular organization's ability <laughs> to successfully do it, but like I agree in 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 general, I think that the Love Hotel, especially, thing. That being said, Love Hotels are very boxy, and so from sort of an, an atmospheric, environmental kind of perspective, I think it would be interesting to see how people kind of rectify that situation because they're not the most like comfortable sort of setups generally. But I want to see the decor and theme left as is. Yeah. Oh, well, well, absolutely. And, <laughs> rotating and the sheets. Bed. And the sheets, yeah. <laughs> rotating so off there's the a bed. couple of, I mean, there's a couple of benefits to, to looking at these properties. Um, you know, first of all, it's a very fragmented market. Um, and so you can pick up hotels fairly cheaply. Um, but also they have the license which is a, a massive a massive plus. It's got a lot of um, infrastructure that's already there that you can use. Um, and um, it's, it's also has the ability to be booked during the day. So uh, especially when the flights are going to start again, which touch wood, they're going to be starting in November, November, December. Um, flights are often coming in at 5 a.m. And hotels are very, very strict about the, the check-in times. So if you're not able to check in until four, you're going to be hanging around during the day, <coughs> uh, sitting in a coffee shop for all that time, sitting on your bags and whatever. So it just makes a lot of sense to have a day stay opportunity. Um, and hotel, I love hotels are beside tra major train stations. So there's a lot of things in their favor. Can um, you rewind for a second? Did you say flights are starting in November? I just got a well December. I just got a I just got an email from Qantas to say that they are ramp they are planning for flights to commence mid December. International flights to Japan to commence mid December. Does that mean that tourists will be able to get visas from November December? Uh, yes. <laughs> really. Yes. It's not official. Hard. It's nothing's official, but that's when they're planning to start their. I mean, Japan hasn't uh, Japan hasn't announced anything yet. But there's. I'm on a lot of travel and tourism. Um, you know, masterminds and groups and and what have you. And people, the the, the noise is getting getting very um, loud. That's that, phenomenal. I had a customer actually mention that. Um, just yesterday, I think, in an email, and he said, oh, well, if November, you know, if the sky's open, I'll be over there. And I'm, I thought that was like next spring kind of thing. Nope. No. Um, they, uh, so um, there's a, and I heard this on Clubhouse two days ago, I think, when you, I was on with you, that um, there is a massive shipment of vaccine arriving now yeah right, um, right. and um enough to make sure that the entire population of japan is vaccinated and they're looking at making sure that that happens by the end of october um and now that the olympics are over um I i'm i'm, I'm be... yeah i'm with matt there on the uh, <laughs> <head> nodding skepticism <laughs> it'll be well, great i mean i, I wish heard that i one really before. hope i'm wrong yeah, but but the, but but I did receive an email from Qantas to say that they are uh, yeah, all things fine. being equal, and you know, obviously they're being very cautious and not saying, well, you know, it's not a hundred percent, but that's this is what we're planning to do. We're planning to start um, mid 
uh, mid-December um, because it just makes a lot of sense because the the biggest time for travel in Japan is is New Year and that is absolute that's after cherry blossoms, that is the peak travel time. Um, you've got all the ski resorts that want to have people in. There's a lot of pressure on the government. It definitely to, makes to sense from the tourism point of view. I'm just wondering. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. On the news recently, was it, uh, it was yesterday? The um, uh, ah, geez, what's it? The, the business, um, the large business organization in, in Japan. Uh, no, no, K. Um, ah, uh, K. Dan Run. Yeah, those guys. They they were pushing um, for to open up business and to reduce the quarantine period to 10 days instead of 14. And for those that are actually vaccinated to have to, like, to completely waive the quarantine requirement. Um, that's th actually that's a big push. I'm, I'm very curious about that vaccination uh, called the vaccination passport or whatnot. Cause like, for example, I got vaccinated in the States. I have my card, but the thing I'm curious about right now is will Japan accept my vaccination versus one gotten domestically. I'm uh, waiting so, to hear comments on that. But if they want to allow well, tourists, they'd have to, right? Yeah, I think. I, the, the idea is, yeah, like they allow vaccinated. Um, it's not just the Japanese returning back to Japan. It's specifically to to waive, um, to allow, you know, non-residents to enter Japan um, without, and if they're vaccinated, to waive the two-week uh quarantine period mm -hmm. so i would assume that, the, that works uh, for exodus, you as well. the exodus would be once we don't have to quarantine coming back i know that i'm going to be out of here in a heartbeat for a couple of weeks <laughs> yeah. well yeah, i'm already I'm... planning we've got, we've got tickets to hawaii for christmas time yeah. um and every, everything's booked and and sorted flight accommodation our visas uh we're just waiting for what the final, like the only thing we that may cause us to cancel is if we still need to do a quarantine yeah. for two weeks coming back. Because yes, with yeah. the kids as well, three kids, right. it's just going to be challenging. We're, we're vaccinated. Well, the adults are as well. So I'm curious how they how they require it for kids. Um, what they because they're seven, they can't actually even get the the the, uh, mm. the vaccine. So it'll be interesting. Oh, that's to see right. What those so you might have are. to quarantine just because of the kids, kind of thing, right? Yeah. So. It'll, We'll have to see how it goes, but that's if we do have to quarantine, that like we may sort of cancel the, the trip. But you could but quarantine we'll in your goes. house, though. You could quarantine in your house. Yeah, I know, but with it's two still weeks three kids. kids. Two, yeah, with <laughs> two kids. And they're all under seven, right? It's like, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. But the, the first group, I think the first group to come will be the relocations. So these are people who have had their. COE, their certificate of eligibility hasn't yeah. been approved. They've got their jobs. There's been a massive talent drain from Japan over the last 18 months. You know, it's, there's a lot of comings and goings on a normal year, but uh, because no one's been able to come in, it's just been a drain. And, yeah. um, and, and even though people are working from home, it's that there's a lot of companies who want the staff here. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge, huge amount of um, inbounds waiting to come in. I know because I've got relationships with relocation companies because they, they're going to need me. Um, they're going to need my places when the borders open up, when the borders open up for those visas. So I think that it's going to happen in stages. So the first people that are going to come in, and I'm hoping that that announcement is going to be coming by the end of this month, that, that the, the new people, the, uh, the new arrivals can come. Um, and then for general uh, tourists will be later on um, in probably December. I've got all my fingers um, crossed for that. Can, can, can we bring this conversation a bit back to real estate? I think we're taking tangent onto it. And especially when it comes to, to, you know, government policy on immigrant on yes. travel and immigration is, I guess, speculation and whatnot. But let's uh, sure. let's bring it back to sort of real estate, um, if that's all right. <laughs> yep. uh, so, um, Matt, yeah, one of my one of my friends, uh, Leah, on the uh, on one of the Facebook groups, uh, building and renovating a house in Japan. She asked a mm. question. And she got a bunch of stuff, and I said like, and I, I saw her question. I'm like, oh, you want to get like sort of a rundown old place in by by the, the beach or by a lake um, or by the snow, uh, then Matt, Matt is the guy to speak to. And she's like, oh, I had some guy named Matt. Like he responded really nicely to, to my question. Um, so, and then, then I realized it was actually you that would do the answer because she's like, oh, there's a bunch of people like responding like just, no, nah, you can't do it. It'll cost too much. It's actually blah, blah, blah. Like just really not, not really scant as you get on, on Facebook, but you, you provided something really, really good. 
Uh, but yeah, her question, and, and I guess just for the listeners to of of this, whoever's listening to this uh, this vlog or this podcast. So her question was like, so she's keen on her idea, and I did tell her to speak to. So she she will reach out. Well, she wanted to get down someplace run down in the countryside and and restore it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the restoration isn't to sort of bring it to like a nice, you know, make it a nice resort kind of place. It's really she wanted to buy a cheap property, so obviously run down place and just renovate it for her to use primarily right, right. To, to to live <clears> as <throat> a holiday house. Mm-hmm. Um, but she mentioned stuff like you know, so a new bar, like full renovation, a new bathroom and kitchen, walls into it, etc. But oh, you're breaking up. Also, roof walls. I, can you hear me? Okay, you can now. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So. Yeah, but she mentioned also roof replacements and wall replacements. When I see that, my idea is it's probably a rundown dump that is going to cost you, like just the money, it's going to cost you too much to try to restore or try, just try to get to sort of satisfactory living. Mm-hmm. But what are your thoughts and what's your experience in terms of how rundown or like what, what the, I'm sure there's a certain level of rundown and deterioration that you can fix to a satisfactory level at a reasonable price be, be, yeah before it becomes not worth it it's just a tear down it's not well restoring. i mean keep, keep in mind that's a good question um keep in mind too that the way that we operate and do business isn't necessarily focused on financial returns it's focused as tracy was kind of pointing out on lifestyle returns mm-hmm. so there is an element of look if you're willing to sink money into a money pit for your own satisfaction or, you know, comfort or, or whatever, then okay, like that's totally doable. Generally speaking, I'd say if you're looking at above 10 mil in renovations, then like, I don't understand what the hell you're doing. Like that doesn't seem mil, like a good idea. Mil yen we're talking about, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Million, t- or 10 million yen, right? 10 million, um, 100,000 US approximately. Yeah, anything more than that. No, that's, and, that's 10 mil though. Right. Anything more than that, and you're like a hardcore hobbyist, which is cool. Um, but again, it's it's a matter of like what the client, what the buyer, what the owner's kind of personal convictions and, and preferences are. Um, if you take into account that a brand new house can be built for 2025, it doesn't really make sense to put more than half of that price into renovating. Well, you know? Unless it's like a really architectural masterpiece and you want to retain everything and that sort of thing. Right. And, and again, that, that brings me back to the lifestyle versus financial return kind of point. I can understand from like a technical point of view, the desire to, you know, rescue a completely devastated property. Like if that's, if that's your jam, totally cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking though, we're selling on average, it's, it's a relatively large space, but between about 8 mil and 20 million yen is what people, the, the price of properties that people are buying on top of that, they're looking at less than 4 million in additional renovations, if any at all. Yeah. So we're talking that again, generally speaking, our clients are maxing out. Oh, die job it is. <laughs> crazy man he's talking to someone <laughs> yeah 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 sorry um totally lost my train of thought 25 max <laughs> okay. out of yeah, yeah. Gen- generally that's that's kind of the roof we've got clients right now with budgets of, of uh 80 mil as well but generally speaking all everything included 25 is kind of the maximum that people are looking at so that's that's a really good number you put out for renovation so in you know, to, to new listeners. So I'm a real estate agent here in Tokyo and I focus just primarily on family homes. People are buying their own personal family place. Generally from uh, like older renovated, older mansions, maybe 40 million yen, so 400,000 US um, is how much they go. But usually houses 70, 80 million up to like 120 million yen is what's common. Um, and what we find is like, re- and we have a renovation team as well on, in our office. So renovations will cost you about a million yen per 10 square meters for just a mid-range renovation. So a 80 square meter house will cost you about 8 million yen. You can probably get maybe 6 million yen, right? But 6 to 8 million yen to renovate. And that means that's new bathrooms, toilets, kitchen, right. um, floors, and wallpaper. Okay. So about a million yen per 10 square meters for mid-range typical brand, like, you know, Panasonic brand, Lixil brand. 
um, fittings and appliances. Uh, if it's a house, then uh, there may be another for the full exterior painting and um, maintenance and roof sort of painting and maintenance, maybe another one to two million yen uh, is what that will cost you. So what you mentioned about four million yen for a rent, like just to restore it and get it up to scratch, sounds very, very fair. That's for like, an, you know, a place like that. Yeah, wallpaper, new bathroom, kitchen. So it's like, yeah. It's, and, it's quite reasonable. And, and, and keep in mind too, the stuff that we're selling, again, generally speaking, there are outliers, but they're, they're properties that they need a little bit of love. They need a little bit of polish and stuff, but we're not talking about like dumpster fires or anything like that. Those are out there. And occasionally we do have clients that are interested in that. But generally speaking, it's, you know, a neglected, but not in any sort of dire circumstances for the properties that they're dealing with. Yeah, I think once you get to structural repair, like with wooden houses, like the wall when exterior when walls need replacing, repairing like the ex the structural walls, that sort of stuff. Mm, that's I, I'd be very concerned about the quality of the building. That I feel will be a money pit. Doesn't matter how much you put into it, it's not gonna get it back. So when yeah, when I think the number the gold number you said is about ten million yen. Once you're going beyond that, yeah, at standard grade kind of renovations. It's like, oh, that's you're not just doing superficial stuff, bathroom, toilets, kitchen, and wallpaper. Um, you're doing more structural. So that means I question uh, how quality of the building. Um, and also when it's that old, one really big cost is windows. So yes. the, the old, like the newer windows are like, you know, even if it's single pane, but like double pane, um, and they, they're an aluminium frame. And they just slide more smoothly, a simple clean, and they'll, they'll be up to scratch. But there's a period like, you know, the 30-year-old plus kind of windows, right, a little right, right. thin metal frame that's falling apart. It's, the shape is bad. Um, changing windows, oh, that's that's really costly. Um, the, yep. the cost, the, the product itself, the material is expensive, and the, um, the, the actual removal because it's built into the wall. Um, we did a whole house, some, uh, we did a three, like our house that we, we, we sold by now, but we, uh, when we did do the windows, I think it was, it was 2 million just for the windows like that. That was uh, 2 million, 2 million yen just to replace um, three sets of sliding door windows. And then like five or six large kind of uh, uh, veranda windows. The total was about 2 million yen just for that. So they're, they're definitely not cheap, but that was double pane. I think if you, can you still even get single pane? Is that still a thing? I'm yeah, sure it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. You get it. Um, yeah, they, they still make it. Um, so some, like some areas, sometimes people in the staircases, stairwells, they will do single pane. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we got quote, quotes for, um, for recently for one of our houses mm. for, um, for additional, like the, the second set of windows within the first mm. set. Because especially with a mansion, like an apartment complex, the windows are part of the common space. You cannot actually change your windows yourself because they belong to the building in overall, similar to balcony. Anything that is on the exterior of the building is considered common area. You cannot just replace the, the balcony doors and, the bal and your windows by yourself. Yeah. So with some older buildings, particularly the, the mansions that are on the, like by the freeway in Tokyo, um, they're quite noisy. So people will get a, a another set of windows built into their window frame. Um, okay, which, which is just within yeah. the interior. So you're not actually touching the common area kind of thing. Precisely. Yeah. So you actually like you'll have if you if it's a slide window, you'll slide open your first window and then there's the original window just right inside it, like two yeah. centimeters, three centimeters away, and you open that. Um, they do a really good job of um, sound, um, blocking sound and of um, uh, insulation because it's basically a new, a brand new window but that's you still have the like old the, uh, rackety uh original one that you have to deal with that's kind of like how if you want to rebuild a home that's actually no longer compliant with zoning laws like you now have to make a you now have to construct a, a smaller structure or you're not allowed to construct anything at all because zoning laws have changed so um, people have mentioned that if you leave the base, if you got a concrete base and you leave that intact, that anything you do on top of that is not officially a rebuild. So you're basically renovating, even though you're reconstructing the entire structure, you're basically renovating it, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, so just yeah, again for for the listeners, what what that's about is 
Um, yeah, with the zoning regulations, you find properties have a, a footprint ratio, like building restriction, uh, the footprint of the building based on the floor size. So often that will be maybe six, anywhere from 40% up to like 80% is, is pretty common. Okay, so the building footprint cannot be more than 40 to 80% of the, uh, the land size. And then the uh, total floor space. So um, the, it's called the, the Yoseki Ritsa Kempe Ritsa and Yoseki right, Ritsa right, Japanese. Right. The total floor space of the building. So that will be anywhere from 80% up to 200%. Um, and then, of course, so what that means is if it's a 100 square meter block of land and the footprint can be 60%, the building footprint can only be 60%. The total footprint, sorry, the total floor space can be hundred percent. That means uh, on a hundred square meter block of land, you can have, for example, a two-story house that's fifty square meters and fifty square meters, right? So total is a hundred square meters. That's how they re that's how they control density. Um, so can, can uh, I, a short end guy, a shopping strip. Oh yeah. Can I can I ask a, a question about that? That's bugged me for a long time. That's yeah. uh, when when looking at any listings, Akia or not, that's that's public information, what you're to the Kenpei yes. Ditsu and, and all that stuff. And the thing that I've always wondered, though, is for your average consumer, does anybody really care about that? Like, why are we telling huh. people this? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, they care about it. If they're considering future rebuilds, they absolutely do. The, okay, um, okay. Yeah, but but what's, what's really important, so it, it's, in, it's important to know and also something you can ignore if you already kind of have something in mind. So a good example is um, we have some, like, I'll, I'll talk about Tokyo because that's where I'm at. Um, and that's like my, my specialty. Um, with zoning, so three-story areas, like I'm in Setagayaku and there's a lot of three-story buildings. So the, the footprint is 60%. And the total building floor space can be about 160%. So mm -hmm. often the block size is a 60 square meter block of land. The building footprint can be up to about 40, 40 square meters. And the total can be a hundred, uh, the three story house can be a total of a hundred square meters. So 160% mm -hmm. of the 60. Right, right. So what you have is maybe a, a 40 square meter first floor, 40 square meter second floor, and then a 20 square meter third floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the total is uh, um, uh, 100 square meters. Now, if you're looking in the area and it's these like, you know, like around my house where it's all a bunch of three-story houses and you're happy with those three-story houses, it doesn't matter so much because you're going to buy, like it, the house in general is going to meet the zoning of what the area is and the density mm -hmm. of the, the surrounding area. But I get some people that say, look, we want a garden. We want a yard, even a small yard, but we want a yard. So... I can guarantee you any place that has the 60% footprint, like the way it's designed for three-story houses, it's not, you're not going to have room for a yard. A 60% 60, 60 of building leaves only room for a driveway, no room for a yard. Mm -hmm. um, even 50%, you're not really going to have room for a yard. What you need is the places that are like 40%. Mm -hmm. So that and often with 40, it's the footprint can be 40% and the building can be 80%, like the, the total floor space. Your security can be 80. That's like often you have that maybe a bit further out in Setagaya, down towards um Tagotamagawa River, or Suginamiku, if you go north, and then the further out you go. Mm -hmm. So just by knowing what the client, like what my client's kind of needs are, I can say, look, you're not gonna find a place with a yard in Kitazawa, Shimo, like near Shimo Kitazawa. You want to live there, but you want a yard. Um, the zoning is 60% footprints. The only way you're going to get a garden is by reducing the size of your house and just having mm -hmm. additional land. But you're paying a huge premium for that land just for a garden space. Right, right, because right. Because that's a place that you can actually build a property on. Right? So it's important to know because it gives you an idea of density. Mm -hmm. But once... You are uh, once you have an understanding of that, yeah. Like in general, if you know, okay, I need a place, I want a garden, so it's a place that is 40% building ratio, like the foot footprint. Then you can do your search, and you can easily, like when you're looking at um, the listings, you can easily rule them out. So, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's kind of important to know just like square meterage, etc. It gives you an idea of the density of the area, um, but even 
a good another good example is you see oh this place one place look it's 120 square meters is the floor size of this building and you look at the zoning and it's 80% is the footprint and 200% building ratio uh, like 200% floor space that's going to be a short term guy when you have an 80% um, mm -hmm. footprint you're right out to the border right the barrier, yeah, yeah 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 right there's very little space around your property that's like a short term guy so that just gives you a really good idea of is this the kind of space I want to live in? Is this the density that I want to live in? So, yeah, it's not overly important to know and it's not essential to know, but just by knowing the basic that I explain now, you can then work out, okay, this is kind of what I want. So when you're doing the filtering, you can do a really quick job of saying, yeah, this is not going to be the airplane. We're um, running into it a lot with investment properties and also with older holiday homes, um, because if you purchase something that was built 20, 30 years ago and um, it, the zoning changed since then, so you now no longer can construct the same structure on it, and sometimes you won't be able to construct anything on it. So if, if you have to tear the place down and rebuild, um, you're basically stuck. I mean, you can turn it into a parking lot, but that's about it. Or, Please don't uh, do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I'm going I'm to say you definitely cannot build it, turn it into a parking lot because the rule for the um, Sai King Chikafuka, which is what you're referring to, yeah. um, is uh, they, they change, like some old properties, you see there's the, the property at the front and then a subdivided block at the back, which has a small footpath to access yeah. the rear property. If that path from the street to the rear property is less than two meters wide, so, for example, 1.5 or 1.8 meters wide, you cannot get re permission to permits to rebuild the property. Yeah. Okay. And that's called, that's no rebuild allowed. It's called Saiken Chikafuka. Yeah. Because now we're going to interrupt this broadcast. I always wanted to say that we're going to interrupt this broadcast to give you a quick reminder that NTI is now partnered with Mita Securities Hospitality Property Fund. And they're offering their mind blowingly gorgeous Machia townhouses in Kyoto. So there's four of them, each about 100 years or older, lovingly restored and renovated to modern standards luxury. Stunning architecture and comfort, all the modern conveniences, including uh, your scenic indoor or outdoor bath, spectacular dining and sitting rooms, disgustingly decadent Japanese or Western style bedrooms, high-speed Wi-Fi internet, kitchen, outdoor decks, Japanese gardens, the works. Now, each of these homes can comfortably host two or three families, including kids. So anywhere from one or two guests and all the way up to a dozen or so. And you can rent the entire house to yourself. So no other guests. It's all yours. Run around naked all day and night long, if that's your thing. Supreme Japanese style luxury accommodation. And since at the moment there are still no foreign tourists in Kyoto, these places are available for rent at ridiculously low prices. So we're talking as little as $430 for a whole week. That's right, luxury accommodation for an entire clan, two families or more, for as little as four, five, or $600 a week. Obviously, the longer the stay, the cheaper the rate is, but you can rent these for anywhere between one or two nights and up to a month or more. So perfect for a weekend getaway, extended holiday, workation, family reunion, company retreat, or even as a gift to a valued client, whatever you might have in mind. And if you book these through our website, you're also going to get an added bonus of one or more 3,000 yen. So that's $30 QO cards, QUO. Those are gift cards that you can use all around the country in convenience stores, restaurants, various stores, lifestyle shops, you name it. The number of cards you'll get depends on the length of the stay, but you'll always get at least one of these. So if you're in Japan, or even if you're out of Japan, but you think that you might be able to get in sometimes in the next year or two, and you've been thinking about spending some time in Kyoto, this is your chance to nab the best accommodation deal possible. So we'll link to the bookings page, which also has some amazing photo galleries for each of these properties on offer. Now they all come with a fully equipped kitchen, but you can also choose to have your meals delivered to the property if that's your thing. The operator can arrange that for you at very reasonable prices. And if you can't see the show notes for any reason, just go to our website, nippontradings.com. That's N-I-P-P-O-N, tradings, with an S, all one word, nippontradings.com. 
forward slash Kyoto hyphen holiday hyphen rentals or just go to nippontradings.com and you'll see the Kyoto holiday rentals option on the top right menu bar. Now we are already taking bookings, so some of the properties may not be available on your dates, but me, the security guys are super accommodating and they'll do their best to find you an available property for whenever it is you're planning your trip, get on there, book your inquiry and take that dream holiday in Kyoto that you've been fantasizing about while these phenomenal prices are still available. And now back to the podcast. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember what year, but you need at least two meters ac wide access to um, from the front road yeah. to to the property. Yeah. So if it's no rebuild allowed, like a car is about two meters wide. Um, so if really? it's actually no rebuild allowed, it means you're not going to be able to get a car through that park to to turn it into a car park. Yeah. Yeah. It depends and on the uh, layout. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to that, actually, because, you know, Ziv, you were talking before about rebuilding in places that kept their foundations. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a situation where perhaps there's been a fire um, and maybe the house is, um, uh, you know, can't, can't actually be accessed because of that two metre rule. And, um, and uh there's a set or there's a setback and you don't want to you know you don't want to go do the setback because you're going to lose a whole bunch of floor space um when you rebuild that place you have to keep the foundations and usually one beam so one central beam um and that's even just one beam uh, means that you uh, it's a rebuild it's not a rebuild it's a it's a renovation yeah. and that's how they get around those doors because otherwise if you know if the if the foundations are gone then you cannot rebuild on that area yeah. so you you'll find sort of especially around you know in some of these tightly packed suburbs houses that have burnt down you know that they, they, they are being rebuilt but under this under this other rule you can't change the the um the footprint yeah, yeah. And, and another case is investment property. So often an investor will buy a place that's got a, like a, maybe a four unit block on it or a small yep. house on it, but they're thinking 10, 15, 20 years ahead, they want to build a small unit block on it. That'll be two, three, four floors. And um, so they need to know whether they'll be able to do that or not. And that's, uh, that's where they often turn down deals because it's just not going to be doable. And if you're looking at doing something for short term rental, um, I, I I think for the license, you need to have the four meter access. Uh, yep. You can't have that two to get the license. You need the four meter access rather than the two meter. So um, how do all yeah. these uh, little Kyoto townhouses much here work? Uh, is that a question for me? So, so how, yeah, how the because I'm work? sure a lot of them don't have any anything like four four meter access. They're just like tiny little guest house. Oh, but uh, that's actually that's that's an old structure, mm -hmm. and they don't need to destroy it just because zoning changed, right? That's yeah. right. Yes, but also you can get min pucker, um, like maybe they're already licensed. But what Tracy's referring to is to get a min pucker, like in in Tokyo, to get a min pucker license, like the short term stay registration. You don't need, it doesn't need that four meter access rule, right? But if you want to get the, the Ryokan or the, the hotel, oh, license, the hotel license, okay, yeah, it needs a, a four meter access to, to the front of the house so that you can't just be a two meter width, it needs to be four, a four meter width yep. access to the front of the house. You know, historic, this is this is kind of just a, a dumb question. Historically, why is it two and four meters? Is there any like specific precedent for that, or is it just kind of an arbitrary? number that was chosen my understanding it's more for safety so previously yeah um, but but like yeah. why not why not two and a half and six meters or something yeah that's that's weird that they like so now i know for example roads have you you heard tracy mentioned before something called setback okay mm -hmm. and setback means okay some all the properties like they, the roads are quite narrow okay so the rule in tokyo is if you rebuild now you need to have two meters back from the center of the road so imagine the center line of the road two meters back if your property extends closer than two meters you have to set back your rebuild and give that port like that portion that just say you're 1.5 meters from the center line you have to give back 50 centimeters of your land mm -hmm. right to increase the width of the road. Right, right. So you, you still kind of own it, but you can't, it can't be built on. It's got to be part of the road for traffic to go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, you know, Japan, you know, Tokyo especially is, is you know, we have, a, we have earthquakes and emergent natural disasters. So it's basically for evacuation. Right, right, um, right. Because, yeah, whereas previously it was really narrow. So similarly, you know, at, at something less than two meters, fire crew cannot access. I figured right. it was fire specifically, yeah. right? Yeah. It's it's always it's always fire in Japan. But to to yeah. tie to tie all this up in a bow, in that that setback, um, it's after the setback that that um, that you have the usable land space as well. So even if you own that land, you won't be able to build one hundred and sixty percent of it. Um, you have to first of all you have to take off the setback amount before you do yeah. the calculations so um it's there's a lot of complex rules but the, the builders are all are all over it so yeah but it's, it's important if you're buying it you want to know in advance what you are and not going to be able to do with it down the track because i mean especially if you're buying something second hand if you're buying buying brand new you got at least 20 25 years but if you're buying something that's um 20 30 years old you really mm -hmm. want to be thinking seven, eight, ten years ahead about what you can and cannot do with it if it, the time comes for that. And yeah. uh, that's where people... I hope people are listening are taking down, you know, writing down the sort of questions that um, that they should be asking their <laughs> yeah. broker when they're doing their due diligence. Um, we, were, uh, we were helping somebody look at a property that um, you can't even... Uh, you can't even park next to like you have to walk 50 meters and it's a house it's not a condo unit or anything like that and it's supposedly out in Inaka it's definitely not in a big city but mm. just the way that the land plots uh, between her and the neighbors were designed from the get-go and the way that the house was built on it you have to walk like 50 100 meters 50 meters if it's through the neighbor's rice field or 100 meter if you're going around the block kind of long long path around um, to park which might not be a big deal, you know, even for the uh, owner occupier, but just imagine you're having fridge delivered or, or you know, anything of that sort. And uh, 100 meter dirt. But I, I got another question that I wanted to flow to you guys, if you don't mind. Um, so this is not specific um, about a city or countryside or mansion or, or house, but and um, somebody said, I want to buy some investment properties. Um, because they're very cheap out of central Tokyo and Osaka and rental yields are great. However, I'm scared of depreciation. I expect to lose a sizable amount of my capital, maybe as much as 20, 30% by the time I resell them in say 10 years time. So what is the reality and how safe is my capital amount? I know I got a lot to say about that, but I, I, I'd love to hear your opinions first. The whole uh, okay. what uh, happens to uh, my capital depreciation fiasco. I, I focus on family homes. So like personal, like people buying a, a residence for personal use. So we don't talk about the investment side of stuff. It's too emotional and it's for where you want to raise your family. Uh, no, but I mean, will I get my money back when I resell in 10 years time, I guess? Straight it up. Okay. Okay. If you buy it now and sell it tomorrow, what's the depreciation versus if you do it in 35 years when the, the house is worth zero? So this is the scenario I give by people that are looking to buy their property. It's easier to just to do with my example with like a wooden structure because you mentioned earlier, Ziv, and Matt, um, you know, to build a brand new house, a wooden structure is about 25 million yen. So it's a bit more complex to say what the value of a mansion of one apartment in the mansion is, yeah. especially because it's concrete and, and you can't, you know, exchange it as easily. So I'll use my example with, um, with a wooden house. Okay. Uh, a three bedroom house, for example, in Setagaya, in Setagaya Ku. Uh, um, you can buy for say, all right. So, um, so 80, 80 million means the property, the building value, if it's brand new, the building value is about, Let's work on 20 million. Uh, let's work, let's do, we'll do 25 million. All right, building value is 25 million and the land value is 55 million. Okay, so you bought an 80 million yen property, land is 25, build, uh, sorry, land is 55, building is 25 million. Let's assume you buy it and sell it the next day. All right, you're going to sell it for the same price. There's no depreciation, right? It hasn't gone down because the building is an age. And it's not like a car, like buying a used car where they drop 25% right when you drive through the lot. 
um, out a lot. That, that's not the case with houses. Okay. So on day one, it's worth 100% of the value. The building's worth 100% of the value. On day, on year 35, and I say 35 years because that's how long the home loan is. All right. The standard home loan is 35 year term. So let's assume the loan is paid off. You want to sell the property. Let's say you haven't maintained it. It's a rundown heap of junk. It needs to be torn down. So it's not livable. It has no residual value in the, in the building itself. It needs to be torn down. What you have, okay, you've lost the 25 million yen of the property value, but you still have the land value. because la like, And we're not assuming, we're not speculating of any increase or decrease in the, in the, market, in the market price. Okay, So land is still going to be worth 55 million yen. Um, and the house, the 25 million is now worth zero. So that's what's, it's depreciate, that's what's depreciated. Okay, you still have the land value. So if you were, but in terms of your home loan, how much of your mortgage have you paid over 35 years? The full amount. So the house is worth nothing, but if you were to sell it at 35 years, you sell the house, it's land value only, your remaining home loan is zero, but you get 55 million yen um, in, for the sale, right? Because that's what the land is valued. Um, to tear down a house is about two, costs about 2 million yen. So, um, in, so if you assume the teardown cost as well, okay, you get 53 million yen back, right? But the depreciation is only on the structure value, not on the land. So depending on what the cost of the property is, right, and with the location of it, um, you're only going to lose out on the, the building value. That's the only bit that goes down. Um, but because you're paying, in terms of the mortgage, you're paying the land value as well in 35 years, the whole lot is, is paid off you're not really going to lose a lot. You're going to end up being on top when the other option is renting. If you were to rent for 35 years, how much do you have at the end of it? Nothing. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you were to get a home loan after 35 years, the house is worth nothing, but you dispose of the land, you get the 50 or 55 million yen yeah. back. Um, so, so that's, that's when I do the extreme examples of brand new property. And then it's, it's full 35 year life has expired. The mortgage is paid off. That's how we calculate it. Um, and generally, people will be somewhere in between. If you sell it after 15 years or 20 years, the house is not worth zero, right? You can't go and buy a 20-year-old house for free, right? It's going to be 55 million yen for the land value plus maybe 5 to 10 million yen for the building value, okay? Yeah. Um, so that's why we see like brand new houses. And if you have a similar use, a 20-year-old house right next to it in the Setagaya area, Maybe 80 million for the brand new one, 70 million for the used one, 65, 70 for the used one that's identical, same land size and same building size. Um, they, they haven't come, come down to zero. So that's my explanation of, when, of depreciation when you're assessing buying a personal home. And that's a good metric for home uh, buyers too, if they're buying a home to live in, to compare the amount of rent that you would have saved versus the uh, amount of depreciation that you supposedly have lost. I guess there's no comparison in most cases, right? Uh, it's, it's such a good deal because the cost of interest is so low. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, um, Matt, I guess from your perspective, um, capital investment in Akia is not really a thing that you'd be considering retaining at all, right? Not really. I have uh, dreams, let's say, of over the course of a number of years, slowly but surely chipping away at the kind of what we're talking about right now and changing that. I think at the moment though, in, in order to do that, and this kind of goes into the flipping territory, yep. uh, as, as we've discussed before, it's what five year, if you buy and then sell anything within five years time, it's like, what is it 40 or 50% um, that you end up having to pay? 40% cap capital gains tax if you flip it less than five years. Yeah, yeah right. And so I've, I've been playing around with this for a while, but like, okay, given a very long span of time, how would you go about approaching this and changing things? And at the moment, the only thing that I can really think about is, well, all right, if there's somebody who's got a lot of money, some time and likes, you know, quasi risky projects, like if they were to buy some stuff up, fix it up, maybe for that five, peri five year period, work with Tracy or somebody on making it a short term rental sort of thing, get that done, hits the five year mark, and then you can start offing it. But the thing is, with that long, that long a period of time, it's it's got to be kind of a special person who would want to engage in this. Yeah. I think. 
Um, so I, I see a way to do it, but I also think that that way that I've, I've thought about anyway is, uh, is not for your average person. Um, so you'd, you'd have, right. I have a question though. Is it because of those two factors, the fact that they're, you know, the houses are depreciable and also the, the capital gains within five years, um, is that what is keeping the house flipping, you know, uh, you know, people are just not getting into it the way they are in other countries. I oh, think no. I think that it's a very good excuse. I think that there it's more, or maybe it's even less complex than that. But because of those two factors, they're really easy to point to, and you know, considerable factors. That's that just puts up a brick wall that a lot of people kind of mentally just don't want or are incapable somehow of getting beyond. Um, and again, that goes back to me talking about like, okay, if there's that special person out there who kind of wants to take on a risky project, then you can probably find a pretty easy solution around it. But there's same thing with Akia too, in general, is that there's, there's a perception, right? There's, there's a narrative about Japan doesn't flip. And if Japan doesn't flip houses, then Japan will never flip houses. And it's kind of tautological. Yeah. Which is in not true, sense. by the way. I mean, we work with a plenty of companies that flip houses on a regular basis and condo units. Yeah, see, there, like, there are examples. There is precedent to do it, mm. but the, yeah. the, accept, the accepted narrative is that, no, this, this never happens. You, you just don't do it. A lot right? of it is also that, uh, don't forget that in the US and Australia and places like that, the, uh, the work-life balance is such that people can actually afford to get into this as a sort of a hobby or a, or a side hustle kind of thing. I mean, can you imagine your typical salaryman, like, you know, renovating and flipping houses as, as a weekend <laughs> hobby kind of thing? It's just, when would they ever be able to do that? So the only, the only people, I want to say companies that are actually doing that are the ones that are doing that as, as, a, as a business, as their job. And then if you're doing it as a commercial entity, you're also not subject to the double capital gains tax within five years. Right, right. And that's, yeah, that's so something that people don't talk about. And I think that would that fact that you just mentioned, Ziv, could and should be part of the solution is that if you do it as a financial entity, as a business, then you, that's one way to get around some of these things. Yeah. Well, well, so, so you say, let's talk about it. So why don't we? And I, I, felt like I often get that question about people say in Tokyo, why don't we flip houses? Like, what, why don't we, what about flipping? What if I buy it, renovate it and, and sell it and make profit? My general state kind of like response to that is you can't compete with the professionals that are doing it flippers okay? yeah and with with the and like professionals I call, I call them renovation companies right so a lot of apartments that we sell the mansions are renovated mansions so a renovation company has purchased the product has purchased the property they've renovated it and then they resell it and they give a full warranty like you know they're a licensed you know um a renovation company and they give a warranty with with the with the uh, renovation, when and they got the connections to make years. it cheap too, right? Like there's no way, so, to get, yeah, yeah, precisely. So what what happens is they have access to financing because that's their business. So they don't need to do the whole home loan process. Okay, that's what they do. So um, generally, they're able to purchase properties below market value, that, and these are properties that never hit the market. They don't do what sort of what most ordinary searchers do and we look online or we check reins like our internal system to find a good deal no what happens is you know there's some you know uh, some family maybe someone's passed away or someone's inherited something they will just contact an agent you know the, the family that want to sell will contact an agent and say look we've got this property we want to sell it um and we want to sell it quick what's the what's the price what's the process and the agent can say look you can get 50 million yen for this property um, and it'll take maybe three months or so to, to sell. And this is how it works. Or listen, I've got my, my friend, their renovation company. They've bought a few properties already in this building. They'll give you 44 million for it. All right. You can sell it for 50 or you can just, you know, and go through all the process. Or you and can you can have it, it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And, and there's no finance required. Yeah. This is how much he buys per square meter size in this building. And he, he'll just, he'll do it. Right. And okay, great. 44 million, 40 million yen, like so maybe 10 to 20% discount. Um, and they're able to, they, they just do it. So the, the renovation company has bought it before it's even reached the public market. Right. They, they have access to it very, very quickly and cheaply. And again, that's and then, doable. I mean, I know people that actually do that. They have a little company. They're not even a big renovation company, but 
they walk the streets. They look for, you know, for, for neighborhoods. We do, where, we do that. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. that, looking for those extra, extra cheap deals. Um, because, you know, it, maybe even somebody was not even thinking about selling it. But, but look, you're old. You might want to be a more, in a more comfortable apartment. Why not move mm -hmm. to the city center? I see around our office, there's been so many cute little, um, cute little farm, yeah, coffee so farm surrounded kind of houses. And they're gone. It's all like units mm -hmm. now. Oh, yeah, but the thing is, so my point is, though, that, that all the, the companies have access to it, like, and uh, the big one was financing. They're able to just pay for it right away. They know the business. There's no muck around. If you're just someone wandering down, up and down the street, trying to find it, and that's not your business, you're going to have no idea what you're doing. You're going to have no idea whether or not yep. it's going to be, um, you know, a good deal or not. What, how much really can you sell it for? And then, and then also the financing. Can you just go up and say, look, yeah, great. We'll just pay cash, 50 million yen, all right, or wh whatever it is. Depends on the area, maybe 5 million, 10, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, are you able just to pay cash for it, right? Whereas the, the renovation company is able to do it, and it's a zero headache for the seller, okay, which is what the seller wants. That's why they're doing it cheap. Then you have the renovation. They're a renovation company. That's what they do, okay? They have access to wholesale price renovations. They don't need um, to, to, and they've already got the themes and designs. They, they know what they're going to do. They know exactly how it's going to be laid out. So they're able to get the renovation done right away at wholesale cost. And then when it comes to selling, because generally renovation companies are also licensed agencies, right? They're able to list it and they can sometimes save on the, the, the agency costs. Okay. Yeah. Um, they don't have to pay the agency fee. Like sometimes mm -hmm. they do, sometimes they don't, but but they save there. They don't need to request an intermediary agent to to do it to list it for them. Uh, Emil, okay. I guess so, I guess Matt's point is, and and I do agree with that, is that yes, there are always going to be the competition that might be doing it more efficiently and more profitably than you. But if you do have the time and the inclination on your hands, then yes, you could you could definitely do that, and and some people do. Yeah, you you can, but how? Like it when you come in terms of the execution, can you do it more cheaply than a professional company? That's not, and then you have just a the taxation. They're not liable to the same capital gains tax that you are. Yeah, no, right? I'm saying set up a company. Yeah. I'm definitely done. I'm definitely not saying do it as an individual, but I mean, yeah. setting up a little um, geisha and doing it is doable. Your profit margin is not going to be as big as theirs, obviously, but it's still doable. Yeah, but 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 that's kind of I think I hope my explanation clears why. Just the ordinary hobbyist, like oh, I'm, I'm Australian, right? So any, any, like sometimes just a brother and sister or some cousins will get together and do a deal like that. And yeah. the banks will support it. The banks will say, oh, you guys want to buy an investment property? They'll finance it. Whereas in Japan, you're not, it's going to be, Good luck with that. <laughs> it's going to be challenging. And that's why we don't, it's not as common an approach um, because when you go try to sell it, you have, if you've got two properties in the same building, the renovation company has bought it more cheaply than you, right? They have renovated it more cheaply than you, and they're not liable to the same amount of tax that you're liable for. So they have more profit margin, and they're able to actually sell it at a cheaper price than you would be and still get a, a similar or better mar profit margin than, than you are. Um, and they can do it more quickly, so they, they don't have to hold it and pay off the mortgage for as long as you do. Um, so, so that, that's why I think in Japan, it's not as easily done or not as common as it is in the West. Also, you, you, there, there is a fashion thing as well. Like in the West, um, you know, in America, in Australia, flipping houses, uh, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of TV shows about yeah. how to do it. Um, it's entertainment. Uh, and people, you know, spend their time renovating on the weekends because they know that there's a capital gain. So there's, it's not just, oh, I enjoy working with my hands and so I'm going to make something look pretty. It's like, I enjoy working with my hands. I want to make something look pretty and I want to make a profit. That makes mm -hmm. it a little more compelling. Well, um, and, and that and hasn't just, reached it here. Well, that hasn't reached here. That I, I wonder if we're on the cusp of it, though, because I think there, so, yeah. there mm. are a lot of TV shows. And in, in fact, I think last I checked, the most popular TV show of all is what? Kotsun to, what is it? Like, uh, Ikenya? Kotsun to Ikenya, which is all about like, holy shit, on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere, there's this cabin and, you mm -hmm. know, a family lives there and, does, and people eat that stuff up, which is like this far yeah. away from, <laughs> yes. from, well, from doing the renovation thing, right? Well, I, but that's because 
there's so few, there's so few shows that are doing this that anything that's being put out there is just being absorbed um and because there's there's i think there's going to be more of an appetite for it because i think people are just getting sick and tired of of um the stupid japanese shows that have been on and that so, might help and, with that too a, a, a new fashion you know a new genre of tv show um could really move the needle in that in that respect so totally, there, there totally. is one cat but there is one cap that we have with Japan properties that we don't see with other properties, and that's the age of the property is an issue, right? For financing, family, it is. Yeah. Well, for financing, but even for resale, right? Actions, any properties, how old is the building? The age of the building is always an issue. Whereas in, in Australia, no one really cares whether it's a 40 or 80 year old building. There's there's no, it's like when, like, when was it last renovated? But there's no issues that it's, uh, if it's an 80 year old building or a 40 year old building that's been, as long as they've been renovated, if they've been renovated recently, then they're comparable to each other, right? Yeah. Whereas in Japan, like, you, once it gets past a certain age, it's really hard to say that, you know, like, again, I, I can't speak for rural areas, I'm in Tokyo, but a 40 year old building, but it's been <laughs> renovated versus a 20-year-old building that's been renovated, the renovation costs, even if they're the same, and even if they're the same quality... I got bees, the, sorry. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> I thought you were being swooped. <laughs> swooped by <laughs> eagles or swooped by, Tom, by I Tommy. I was wondering why you were looking up for <laughs> <laughs> Just change your filter, the bees will go away. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, like the age of the building, I think you, you can't keep doing that because um, the renovation won't... Like you can renovate a 20 year old building, but sometimes, you know, spending 10 million yen to renovate a 40 year old building, it's easier to rebuild it. And, and that's the thing too, is going, going back to what I was saying about like the special person who just needs to accept the risk in order to change the reality that you've just described. <laughs> <laughs> in, in order to change the reality that you've just described, it's basically a blunt force solution. Some like there needs to be a, an established precedent, a trend of, okay, we just ran in and we did it. And yeah, we spent a bunch of money, but because we did it correctly, you know, over the course of five, 10 years, whatever, um, now it's doable, right? Like the way that things are established right now are not going to change unless they change is kind of mm -hmm. like the answer, right? Well, now that more people are moving out to the countryside or at least the ones who can, um, that, that might be something. That's an important distinction yeah. to make too, yeah. as well. It's not, it, it, it's unfortunate, but it is not the case that everybody can move to the countryside yeah. only, or, only or those whatever. Who can. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, but the ones who are moving are probably the ones who do have the resources to take Precisely. on the like, DIY project yes. too, right? Yes. All right. So uh, we're probably going to call it a day soon, I guess. We're at the uh, hourly mark. Or do we have anything else that we want to bring up? There's so much. There's so much. But uh, right. I think we can easily <laughs> leave that for, for another time. Yeah, this conversation does not, doesn't end. Um, uh, if anyone... Uh I was just going to say, how many people, like, uh, do we have some stats on how how our first one went from last week? And um, uh, I can give it to you right now. So. And uh, what has been the response? Has there been, has there been uh, people writing in? Um, do we ask to like and subscribe or um, um, well, write people, some questions? <laughs> we do have likes and subscribes and we do have people writing in, but they're writing in privately. They're not telling us anything in the comments section except just giving us some likes. Okay. So we know That's, that. Yeah. So I'm I'm generally one of those people. Actually, like I don't like, I don't even like on on people's uh, videos and stuff like that. I don't like my yep. strange. Um, yeah. Like so, what what I what I view or whatnot to be so publicly uh, available. Um. So, but definitely, and this look, especially when we talk about financing and real estate, um, people have questions that involve sort of their intention, their finances. Um. Especially like in my case, like people buying a family home right just talking about their budget to begin with um sort of gives an in can easily give an indication of sort of just finance and or, or income so um what what's pretty common is people just reach out on any of the social media um platforms which i think zip your, your link below i think uh someone told me in the, the previous video he wrote my name's email uh, um it's a uh, emil so to anyone who uh is curious yeah it's a uh, it's emil e-m-i-l so 
yeah, you can reach out to me um, via Instagram or Facebook Messenger, any of the messaging platforms or email um, <laughs> uh, as well. Um, and we can just have a phone call um, to, to discuss sort of your personal needs and, and your particular situation. That's generally a 60-minute phone call, um, 60 to 90 minutes it ends up sort of being, uh, should get anyone who's a bit curious about whether they can buy a property in Tokyo, again, this for purchasing your own family home, um, what financing options are available to you, whether you're permanent resident or on a working visa, et cetera, what your strategy should be, how much you can borrow based on your income and uh, what the loan repayments are going to be. And also what kind of property you can find around Tokyo for your particular budget. Uh, yeah, if you anyone wants to discuss that, please uh, hit me up. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about that anytime uh, on, on a call. Um, and yeah, I think uh, everyone else, if you guys want to quickly explain sort of how people yeah, that's can a good idea because we haven't done an uh, intro this is like episode two we're well into the season yeah. now. but tracy just before that quickly <laughs> answer your question so since last week which is when we uh uh sorry not last week since the last three days which is when we published we've got um 157 full downloads of the podcast episodes and 80 views on youtube but um we get a lot of likes and a lot of shares, but no comments. I think because it's like Emil was saying, this is financial private stuff. So people prefer to just email in about it. But mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so Tracy, Matt, tell them what you can help them with. So I can help um, with any questions about short-term rentals uh, in Japan, mostly Tokyo. I'm really Tokyo-based. Um, but I can um, show some stats on, uh, and between Ziv and I, we can show stats of, um, you know what the the return on investment on uh, different sized different sized properties and uh, you know in in terms of um, how much per uh, per one LDK two LDK three LDK you can be making um, in short term rental versus long term rental and that if you're if you're a pure investor then those sorts of figures are going to be really important for your due diligence so that's based on my ten years of experience in short term rentals in Japan um, I am also a minpaku kandi which means that um, I am a um, <laughs> A manager, a property manager for short-term rentals. So I do. I have my own properties that I own. I have properties that I rent, which is called rental arbitrage. And I also co-host. So people that have a house, um, they they own a house. They perhaps want to use it part time, and the the rest of the time I rent it out for them to pay their bills on short-term rentals. So that's what I do. Um, and also, I just love real estate. I'm just a bit of a nerd that way, and I just love hanging out with you guys. It's it's fun. Thank uh, you. I, I am Matt, and I run Akia and Inaka. Uh, if you want to check out all of the awesome adventures and the possibilities of rural Japan and abandoned property, uh, hit us up. We can take you from all the way through the search process, vetting process, due diligence, and brokerage. Uh, so if you want to find really good deals, but which will nevertheless you know, not cost you five hundred dollars. Probably more like at least five thousand. You mean they're not a dollar a home? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not a happy well, meal. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> we we can uh, we can locate some excellent deals for you, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's a conversation we can have if you get in touch with us. So email us, call us, contact us on social media. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to live with goats and bees, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm probably anything in between. So um, not usually family homes because you wanna you want somebody like Emil to take you uh, by the hand and just go and look at places with you. And um, we actually prefer not to deal with short term rentals directly. So we work with uh, people like Tracy for that. And we also prefer any not we prefer not to go the uh, fully abandoned home house, but anything in between, which is investment properties, uh, long-term leases, standard uh, cash flow properties, um, short-term rentals by the month kind of thing, not real Airbnb guest type, so short-term leases, and uh, holiday homes, if you need somebody to remotely assist you in purchasing the perfect holiday home um, that you can use once in a while anywhere in Japan, and then you can use Tracy to rent it out when you're not here. Um, then we are probably the ones to contact. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. And we shall probably see you next week. All right, cool. Talk to you later. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.
All right, good fun as always. Really interesting chat and a huge thank you as always to Tracy, Matt and Emil. I I'm really enjoying our regular chats. I hope our viewers and listeners are as well. And again, quick reminder, December 10 to 12, Friday through to Sunday at the Hotel Montan in Hakata, Fukuoka. Day only tickets now available at even cheaper prices. So come and join us as we talk business, mingle, network, eat, drink and play a whole lot of awesome games. So yeah, whether you're a gamer with some interest in business or a business person with a geeky streak like yours truly, or any combination of the two. This is promising to be quite the event. Hope to see you there with us. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time, and until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku!